Ray Armentrout, you are a professor of writing in the literature department at the University of California at San Diego and the author of 10 books of poetry, including Money Shot, Versed, Next Life, and Veil, New and Selected Poems, and most recently, Just Saying, published by <laughs> Wesleyan University Press. She is the winner of the 2010 Pulitzer Prize for Poetry and the 2009 National Book Critics Circle Award. Welcome to the Bibliophile. Thank you for having me. You were influenced by William Carlos Williams. Mm -hmm. And uh, Williams was interested in place Mm -hmm. and the local. I wonder how that might have affected your work. Well, I am interested in the local to the extent that I, I'm, I write based on kind of incoming stimuli, so whatever is around me. And, you know, so if I'm traveling, that becomes the local. But, but when, I, when I'm at home, what's around me, what comes in, I am very reactive to. So, so you observe. I'm, I'm a, I observe, and I'm, you know, it's, it's very much a sort of present moment kind of localism, I guess. What I really learned from Williams, I think, was something about the line, because when I was growing up, my mother read poetry to me, and she read, uh, like, Longfellow, metered poetry. And I kind of had an ear for it, so that when I was in seventh grade, I actually wrote a book report in the meter of Hiawatha. So Uh when I wanted to start writing more modern verse, um, I had a hard time breaking that habit of sort of iambic pentameter. And uh, then when I discovered William's line, I kind of got it, you know, how to do it. And also um, I was inspired by his use of line break, which later you see in an even more extreme version, maybe in Robert Creeley's work. He was interested in sort of looking around, Mm -hmm. as as you are. And in fact, a quote of his goes, no ideas but in things. Well, I think that sometimes people take that too literally and take it to mean no ideas and that all you can do is describe things. I think what he meant is that you um, need to sort of get the ideas from the immediate context, of course, includes things. I feel if, if I kind of make something up, which I sometimes do, but I feel a little guilty almost about having made something up. Maybe that, <laughs> maybe that comes from Williams. It's the, the opposite of Coleridge and Kubla Khan, I suppose. You feel like your poetry needs to be rooted in, in the real. You feel guilty for not rooting it in the real then when you, when you stray from that. When I change something, yeah, although I do change things at times. And I use dreams too. And so, But, you know, they, they also are the real because mm-hmm. they occur. They're not willed. They just occur. Well, they're real for the feelings that you experience mm-hmm. while you're dreaming. Yeah. Or, one of the other characteristics of your poetry is, is the use of uh, juxtaposition of, well, the real and the imaginary, and how those kind of bang into each other. Mm-hmm. I do really like to juxtapose different tones, what I hear as different voices, different situations, so that the poem comes at whatever it's coming at from different angles. Yes. I'm not sure if it's the real and the imaginary, so much as different registers uh-huh. of the real. For instance, One section of a poem could be something I overheard a person say. One section could be a description of plants, and another section uh, could be something I read about particle physics, you know. Mm. So it doesn't seem as though those things could go together, but maybe they can. Maybe there's a thread, you know. So in my mind, poetry, my poetry, is, is about looking for the thread. You mentioned thread, I think of like, almost like a little depth charge. Oh, that's a good metaphor, huh? <laughs> um, because uh, listening to you uh, read last night, I was put in mind of haikus. Mm-hmm, and mm-hmm. haikus are m- much like the tip of an iceberg. Mm-hmm, you just sort of mm-hmm. throw a little catalyst mm-hmm. out and wait for it to react. And I was influenced when I was uh, a teenager or in my early 20s by Basho and Busson, and by how much they could express in, you know, such a single, simple, simple-seeming image. So uh, the experience of place, then, there's, there's a, a variety of different ways of being in a place. There's reading about it in mm-hmm. poetry or novels. There's sort of visiting it and seeing it for yourself. And then there's the tension between the, the difference between the two of those things. 
So I wonder if you could, and then of course there's your, your memory of being in a place and the change that's taken place over mm -hmm, that time. So mm -hmm. perhaps you could uh, talk a bit about, you mentioned that San Francisco was one of the best places to be a poet or become a poet mm -hmm. back in the, yeah. was it the 70s? Yes. So if we were planning to go to San Francisco, can you talk a bit about what it was like back then and and how you might be able to capture some of that now? Well, what it was like back then was that um, it was full of, full of young writers or aspiring writers, many of them sort of slackers in that you could get by with, you know, working a part-time job or working um, a job that was kind of casual. For a while I had a job working as a teacher's assistant in an elementary school, you know. Mm -hmm. It wasn't expensive like it is now. I mean, it you know, wasn't super cheap, but you could kind of have that bohemian lifestyle. And so that left you with a lot of time to talk. And then San Francisco has a, a long literary tradition, of course, the Beats and the San Francisco Renaissance, but before that, Jack London. and you know. So there were already a lot of places where you could read poetry, poetry venues when I got there. Like bookstores would hold yeah. readings. Yeah, or there was, a, there was a place pubs. called Intersection, I'm not that I'm not sure what kind of organization that was, but it wasn't a bookstore and it wasn't a cafe. Mm -hmm. And then there was a cafe called the Grand Piano where uh, we had a bunch of readings that we organized, my friends and I. And then people were running presses. I didn't, but I knew several people who uh, edited magazines. You know, we would just sort of put them together and mimeograph parties or what is it, you know. Nice, right. And, and um, it was kind of you know do it yourself. Was DIY, there, as they say now. <laughs> yeah, and was there a, like was there a particular neighborhood that was where you hung out in that would? The, the, oh, the, it was it was all over really. Yeah. I I lived um, in the Castro, and uh, the the place where we had the the readings. There was there was one that was in the Hate. The Grand Piano was in the Hate, and then of course. There was City Light, which mm. is, you know... Still Yeah, still going on. And that's, that's one of the uh, really old San Francisco literary institutions. So in San Francisco, you just got the feeling that it was normal to be a poet or mm. an artist of some kind. They took you seriously. Yeah. It was, whereas in San Diego, uh, it was, and to some extent still is, not something you'd want to say in public. <laughs> <laughs> Well, why is that? Because there's so much rational thinking there? I mean, the all these military don't... and scientific types? Or... <laughs> Actually, I've, I've found on, on campus, at least, that the, the people in the sciences and in medicine are kind of interested in hooking up with the humanities. Mm -hmm. They feel like they're missing out on that. Yeah. I mean, more just, you know, in the city in general. It's a big city um, that's very spread out, a lot of suburban parts. So kind of like L.A. in that way, except without the movie industry. And, you know, a lot of families. Mm -hmm. Suburbia yeah. and, yeah, and uh, right. middle class. Uh, exactly. Just want to get on with Want to get life. on with it, yeah. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> not, not everyone. I mean, there are some hipper neighborhoods these days. But. In other words, people that think, uh, this, is, this is again from uh, uh, William Carlos Williams, it is difficult to get the news from poems, <laughs> <laughs> yet men die miserably every day for lack of what is found there. Yeah. So that's what we're touching on here. Yeah. I would die miserably, I think. <laughs> I'm not sure those other people are, maybe. or they don't know it yet. Right. They're dying miserably, and they don't even know it. Yeah. No. Like a frog in <laughs> boiling water. That's, yeah. I think I really need, you know some kind of art. When I was growing up, there was none around. and um, This was in San Diego. Yeah, and yeah. I was, it was partly because of where I grew up, which was sort of in eastern San Diego, in a, uh, not by the coast, and, you know, far away from anything, really. So I already knew. I don't know how I knew, but I knew that I was interested in poetry, and I knew that I was interested in art, mm -hmm. and I just really couldn't find any. I finally, you know, started finding anthologies of poets that... It took a while. It took a while to ever see a painting, you know, that wasn't just like, uh, you know, the kind that you buy at the furniture store. Or yeah, something. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> kind of like Muzak. <laughs> yeah. Except, so you you uh, found this though mm -hmm. at university, right, at Berkeley? 
Yeah. I, well, yeah. actually, I went to San Diego State first for a couple of years, which was near my house, and then I transferred to Berkeley. But, and, you know, I began to find more culture at San Diego State. But then Berkeley, you know, sort of amped that up. And at Berkeley, I found not only books, but also people who were writers, you know, living writers. Yeah, which the is real different. thing. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, so what examples of what uh-huh. it could be like? Yeah, I, I uh, took a class with Denise Levertov. And I met Ron Silliman, with whom I read last night when I was at Berkeley. Mm-hmm. What about then uh, visiting visiting San Francisco, let's say, right now? It's like, uh, how, how would you kind of uh, capture that vibe? Is there a way of doing it? Well, I, San Francisco has changed a lot. Now I think you would want to probably visit uh, maybe North Oakland or something. San Francisco has gotten so expensive that it's kind of a suburb of Silicon Valley now. I mean, there are still some poets who live there, but I hear that there are very few under 40. You know, mm-hmm. it's astronomically expensive. Yeah, well, isn't that just the way it is? Uh, poets and artists will will seek neighborhoods that are a bit run down and, yeah, where the rents are cheap, right? Uh-huh, yeah. right. I and mean, now, of course, uh, all of the, the poets are leaving Manhattan and moving to Brooklyn, so the same thing happens <laughs> everywhere. Yes, yes. Perhaps we could, speaking of, of place, I could get you to read a a poem that might riff off what we're talking about, you know. Okay. Let me see. What did I want to do? All right. This is one I didn't read last night, and it's not especially about San Diego, but it is especially about the United States. I mean, it sort of starts with thinking about, actually, national parks and the people who left a record of first visiting them, and then it goes, it moves to... um, an interview I saw on television with a a military sniper. So it connects to what we were talking about in in that it connects to the military at the end. Parting shots. Long, confident sentences of the early visitors, so unlike ours, so much like one another, remark on the sculpted grandeur of the walls, and then, with one light touch, on the bracing sense of insignificance that they impart. Behind the only wall in sight, the defamiliarized wall, a sniper tells a camera crew his work is invigorating because it's personal. <laughs> That's, uh, you, can't, you couldn't make that up, <laughs> no, right? No, you, you cannot make it up. <laughs> oh, goodness. And then That's I, like a punchline you delivered there, <laughs> isn't yeah. it? Yeah. And then I guess I could read one more, and this is, some of this is um, based on things I saw in San Diego, but I think it's also based on just the kind of um, sense of emptiness or placelessness or rootlessness I was talking about before. Sure. So it's called Remainder. String of empty offices, illuminated, festive. People exist to attach importance I practice high-speed D selection. The difference between nothing and nothingness is existence. My dead friends don't visit me. They say I didn't know them. You are cautious, indolent, stubborn, skeptical, gentle, tense. At sunset, pigeons practice synchronized flying. Thus are becomes is. Is becomes ness. Let the burning spill extend. I think of absence. Mm-hmm. I think of, and in fact, again, when you visit a place that you've read a poem about or read a novel about, part of the experience is you're present and there's an absence. It's, mm-hmm. it's, yes. not, yeah. it's not what you think it is. No, and that's, that's actually, of course, a big theme in literature, <laughs> in, 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 say, Proust or something, that you, you never actually can occupy the place of the fantasy. And, I, and there are so many fantasies about Southern California. They're mostly about L.A., but maybe about San Diego, too. And stereotypes, you know, that it's all about the beach and it's all about this wonderful relaxation and sunset and sailboats and... Um, Whatever that might symbolize. I think that mm-hmm. might be what people think of. But they probably think of the zoo, too. But, <laughs> but there, as you were mentioning, there aren't that many novels that are really mm-hmm. sort of set in San Diego that you're aware of. But there is this good book, right? Yeah. It, it, yeah, right. It, it's, it's called Under the Perfect Sun by, by Mike Davis. 
Okay, and that just gives you a, a history of the city? Yeah, and... he's um, a leftist thinker. He also wrote about L.A., uh, a book called City of Quartz. And so he does a kind of, I guess, political history of, the, of places. What about the things that a, a book lover or an aspiring poet might like to do when they're in San Diego? Any... Well, yeah, we uh, there are some other poets besides me there, and we have <laughs> and we have reading series. So there is a new um, reading series called Agit Prop that I would recommend. And there's is that a, through the university or no, no? And that's the good thing about it. I mean, we have a series at the university at UC San Diego and San Diego State, where Ilya Kaminsky and Marilyn Chin work. Um, also. They have a series. But for a long time, the only place that you could really hear poetry in San Diego was on campus. And now there are two independent series, which I take to be a very good sign. One is Agitprop. It's been going on for a while. And the other just started up at a venue called Digital Gym, which also shows sort of experimental films. Hmm. So I I take that to be a a good sign. And Mm -hmm. some young poets are moving to San Diego. I'm not sure why, but that also is a good sign. Not just for the weather. I don't. I can't mm. tell you why. Yes, but <laughs> yeah. Is it relatively inexpensive to live there? No. Can, no, it's not. It's not. Okay. They, you have to pay for that weather. So, I mean, there are older poets like Jerome Rothenberg and David Anton, who's also an art critic. And his wife, Eleanor Anton, is a, a well-known feminist artist. They live there. And Ilya Kaminsky, as I said, who teaches now at San Diego State, is a Russian immigrant poet. And Ben and Sandra Dollar are a couple of lively uh, live wire poets you'd want to meet if you came there. What about uh, your favorite used bookstores? Okay, Am well, I... there's, yeah, there's one in La Jolla, not far from the university, called D.G. Wills that's new and used, and it's been there for decades, and they have poetry readings there. I didn't mention that one, but they do, and uh, not just poetry. Lots of people read. I mean, it's amazing who Dennis, that's his name, Dennis Wills, can get to read there. One time Ginsburg read there, and they had to block off the street. The crowd was so big, you know. Oh. But other people who are not poets, like Francis Crick of DNA fame, who um, died pretty recently, but he was living in Borrego Springs, which is in the desert not far from San Diego, just kind of over the mountains. And he came and read at D.G. Wills, something right. from a, a recent book he'd published. So, yeah, I would de- definitely Check that out. Okay. Huh? What about uh, rare book libraries, the well, special collections? We have at UC San Diego, we have a terrific special collections. We have um, the papers of George Oppen and James Schuyler and Ron Silliman and Lynn Higinian and Joe Brainerd, a New York school poet, and on and on. Some of mine, too. <laughs> oh, great. Okay, so we can we can just go to that. It's on campus. Mm-hmm. It's on campus. It's open to the public, and you can look at people's letters. It's, it seems like an invasion of privacy, especially if they're living, but people will, it's amazing what people will do for money. They'll sell, they, they will <laughs> sell their letters, and you can look right. at their drafts. And uh, What about writers' festivals? Any Is there anything going on in that regard? Yes, there's something called Border Voices mm-hmm. that happens once a year in the spring, um, usually in Balboa Park, and the organizers have a good bit of money, and they, they bring people in, so... That would be something to check out. I think it's in April. Okay. What about in San Diego, places or neighborhoods where there is that sort of bohemian Mm -hmm. vibe? Yeah. Is there an area that that you recommend? There are now. Um, I guess the most happening new neighborhood is called North Park. Used to be kind of run down, Mm -hmm. but now I feel funny quoting Forbes magazine, but (laughs) Forbes magazine had a list of the 20 hippest, neighborhoods in the United States and North Park, to my surprise, came in number 13. Okay. So we made the list with one neighborhood. And again, what, sort of nice coffee shops and... <laughs> yeah, restaurants and... Trees and... Trees, yeah, well, there are trees everywhere in San Diego, mostly palm trees, but <laughs> um, but yeah, there's, there's good food there, good restaurants, okay. and also art galleries, which is kind of new to San Diego to have a a neighborhood with a lot of galleries. I'm not saying that they all have good art, but it's a place where young artists can show their work. Right. And so there are a lot of young people on the streets there. And, you know, people. the streets are crowded at night, which is not common to a lot of neighborhoods in San Diego. I live in a neighborhood humorously uh, called Normal Heights. 
<laughs> Which is quite near North Park. You could walk between them. And it's on the other side of town from Abnormal? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. It's named for an old normal school, which is what they used to call teachers' colleges, where I guess you taught the kids to be normal. I don't know. but uh, <laughs> <laughs> Poetry's not going to make them normal. <laughs> they, have, they have signs. I don't know. If, I, don't, I don't imagine you have that here, but in San Diego there are signs hanging across the streets, across the commercial streets in different neighborhoods. So we have a sign over Adams Avenue that says Normal Heights. I uh, had my picture taken under it once. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. Just, just a normal height, you know, yeah. no, no higher. <laughs> That's right. Average. Yeah. Exactly. Finally, uh, the reading you did last night, I, was, I particularly enjoyed SLU. Mm-hmm. And uh, there was a lovely piece that you did, again, sort of applying your imagination and, and rewriting one of Shakespeare's sonnets. Uh, Would you like me to could, read those? Could, could you? Sure. They're in the forthcoming book, which is going to be called Itself, and will be out early 2015. And uh, I should say that I was invited to rewrite a Shakespeare sonnet, which I at first thought was sort of ludicrous, but then when I uh, read Shakespeare's sonnet... The psychology of it seemed very peculiar to me. It's, it's Sonnet 3, and uh, in it, Shakespeare is advising a handsome young man that he'd better get married and have kids quick so that he can pass on his image into the future. Mm-hmm. And uh, Immortality, you know, immor- that's his, that's Im- his immor- ticket. Immortality. Um, but, you know, you have to wonder why he was so focused on this handsome young man. So <laughs> I just made a kind of perverse poem out of it. Sonnet 3. Your dad told me to tell you how good you look to him right now. Check yourself out. I'm sure you do. You're a very pretty boy. But the thing is, that won't last. Have you ever seen a pert old man? An insouciant septuagenarian? I thought not. They're invisible. And you'll be invisible, too. What will your dad have to look at, then? Do you think growth rebounds each year? Wrong. It has to be outsourced, sublet. Get with the program. Your dad will be watching. All right, now let me see if I can find the other one you were talking about, which is called Sponsor, actually, but there is a slew in it. (laughs) It's the one with the Coke truck. Yep, this is it. Okay. I found it. Great. Okay. Sponsor. We drove to the slough and walked briefly along the uneven path. There are plants here you see nowhere else, you said. Pickleweed, duckweed, branching pipettes. Among twenty brown hills, the only moving thing was the Coca-Cola truck. That last bit is actually a riff on Wallace Stevens in the beginning of 13 Ways of Looking at a Blackbird, which goes, among 20 snowy mountains, the only moving thing was the eye of the blackbird. (laughs) I like the Coke truck. (laughs) Yeah, it's the new world. (laughs) (laughs) And the world changes, and we have to cater to it and and deal with it. Deal with it, yeah. So uh, thank you very much for helping us to deal with it. Okay, well, thank you. I've been speaking with Ray Armantrout, who is a professor of writing in the Department of Literature at the University of California at San Diego and the author of 10 books of poetry, including a Pulitzer Prize winner and the National Book Critic Circle winner. Her latest book of poems is entitled Just Saying. Thanks very much. Thank you.